Are we recording? Perfect. Okay. So um, I touched upon chapter 10 uh, this morning. Now I'm just going to try to get aggregate demand and aggregate supply out of the way um, for the huge review session I'm doing. I'm not going to touch chapter 24 because that's history. And frankly, <laughs> you guys can read it and help me out because I can't be asked. Uh, to read that. So chapter 10 is um, one of the easiest chapters we've seen. Um, it is, it will probably take me like 15 minutes. So strap in, it's going to be easy as hell. And yeah, so chapter 10, it mostly looks at um, like, where's that? Yeah, it, you can mostly uh, say this chapter is about uh, growth. So this is be growth. So how the book defines growth it here is steady increases of outputs of output over time. So that's your definition of growth. So you can see growth mostly in a country's GDP. So a country's GDP. Okay, that doesn't want to work. Uh, you have here, that's your GDP, this is time. And if a country is growing, it'll look something like this. Just up, 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 just generally following an upwards trend. Um, but something to note is that uh, over time populations also grow. So the best way to measure growth is not necessarily GDP. Um, I'm just going to clear this. Not necessarily. Really best way. The best way in uh, usually is measuring it uh, by the growth of GDP per capita. Because this, oh god, uh, this, GDP per cap per capita, it'll follow the same trend similar to this. So you're gonna have like uh, you're gonna have like a recession there and whatnot that generally follow the same trend. But if your GDP per capita is growing, so if your GDP per cap is increasing, you can assume GDP is also increasing without it being from population growth. Because if say Tuvalu uh, produced a billion dollars uh, and had a billion people, and next year they uh, they suddenly grow to two billion, um, and uh, they produced 2 billion as well, the GDP per capita is going to stay the same. It's just, um, it's just uh, the GDP, yeah, GDP per capita is going to stay the same, but what you want is GDP per capita to grow. So um, this chapter, uh, or sorry, this, this correction is called something on this adjustment mostly, it's called purchasing price parity. And this allows you um, to compare, uh, just allows to compare uh, between poor and rich countries. And why why is that? Um, so, for example, um, in a country like Japan, and say you're looking at the production of jeans, Japanese denim is world renowned for being expensive and well made, um, but it's gonna cost you a lot more to produce a pair of jeans um, than say in uh, any of the BRIC countries. Um, so you have to adjust it. Um, by uh, the purchasing power parity in order to correct for any variations in like how costly it is to produce. 
and this can mostly be seen through uh, production. So this usually is measured in either output or worker. Or uh, you can also see it in output or hour. That's the two ways. Um, so GDP, and going back to our dear GDP, growth happens due to uh, something called the force of compounding. To the force compounding. Uh, so that, um, what I understood, uh, means that assets grow uh, on each other. But there's also something called convergence, which is uh, within the, within the, within the same uh, subtopic, this convergence. Uh, this literally means that smaller countries Uh, grow faster. Um, so an example to give is basically uh, if you see the the pro like where the United States was um, in 1945 and you saw where either like Korea or Japan were um, or sorry um, they they mentioned the uh, four Asian tigers which I think is South Korea, Hong Kong and another two. Um, I'm not going to research that, but they say basically from 1945 to here, the U.S. has grown, of course, but the the proportional growth from the four Asian tigers is a lot higher because now there are world-class economies. Well, in 1945, there were barely uh, developed countries, none, not even. Um, so yeah, that's what you have to know about convergence and the force of compounding. So something this uh, this book talks about also is the Easterlin paradox. By the way, this whole like first part of the chapter is just uh, jibber jabber. It's just wording, um, but uh, a little bit further we will actually see a little uh, formulas. So the Easterlin paradox basically means, in simple terms, uh, paradox. I don't even know if the teacher gave us this in her slides. I studied it another way. Um, so money doesn't buy happiness. Happiness. And um, if any of you have taken uh, economics class in high school, you probably saw this where like you saw the happiness, uh, the happiness index of any um, of uh, countries. And you can see that there are some really rich countries that are not as happy as really poor ones. Um, the Eastern paradox basically tells you uh, that money doesn't buy happiness after needs are met. That's the gist of it. And finally, uh, you have the Malthusian trap, which I was not happy to hear the name Mal Mal uh, the Malthusian theory again. Um, and a Malthusian trap means that uh, there is a stagnant uh, period of growth. Period of growth uh, due to, to uh, poor technology. That's all you have to know about the motivation trap. They don't go too much into depth and you should either. Um, so we finally get to actual formulas. So um, the first formula is aggregate production. I'm gonna put this underneath so you guys don't think it's another chapter. Okay, get production. Um, so just give me one second. I'm just moving my desk around. Um, so the formula here is, um, why, why are we studying this now? Uh, y equals F, uh, K, N. All right, fucking, um, great. There goes my chance to show this to the VBA. Anyways, uh, so why, um, y is equal to output um then k is equal to capital 
and then n is labor which is uh, something I tried to uh, tell you guys the previous chapter and it's labor case capital. Um, and that's why I said F is technology because F is the state of technology in that country. Uh, by the way, just as a, as a, this capital means any assets you may have. So like um, factories, uh, eh, like, factories or like machinery, anything that counts as capital. Um, so where you can see this uh, two different ways. So you have, uh, sorry, three different uh, ways. So you have constant returns to scale. Uh, the formula for constant returns to scale is X of Y equals F X of K and X of N. So if you remember in math, um, last year with um, Mirko, we mostly looked at this as lambda. Um, this was uh, lambda. So what you're saying is, is that for every increase in lambda, so you, you're adding lambda, your output Y is going to uh, increase by the same amount. That's what constant returns to scale uh, means. So then you have your decreasing returns on capital. Uh, so by this, um, you mean for every increase in capital, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get a decrease uh, marginal production. Um, and I put Y prime as, um, a production function, its derivative would be uh, the marginal output, but I'm just going to put a uh, decrease in marginal production. This is what I mean. Um, and you also have a decreasing, rec decreasing returns on labor. Uh, this is N. So you have uh, increasing N will yield a decrease in uh, marginal uh, production. So what this means is that if you suddenly add um, one worker, if you usually, for like an example, uh, in constant returns, you add one worker, you get one more unit of output. Here, you add one worker, you're going to get half a unit of output, and there's a point even, and you can, you're going to see it in the graph. And we saw this in microeconomics where... Uh, you can even go negative and like workers start getting in the way of each other and you actually lose production. Um, so let's actually move this a bit. I'm sorry that uh, I'm putting this like as if it was another chapter. It's not, but I'm just, it's easier uh, to keep this within the same page. So uh, here we go. So the book, um, basically tells you that uh, this thing called the output per worker and then capital per worker relation. So I'm gonna put this here, output per worker uh, to uh, capital per worker relation. Per worker. And this may sound a bit daunting at first, but once I put labels on everything on the formula, you're gonna get it 100%, so don't worry. Uh, so you have Y over N, and you can start uh, thinking about the variables uh, we've been labeling as. Uh, you have F of K of N, or K over N, and then N over N. Um, and this basically cancels out, and this is equal to one. So you have that, uh, y over n is equal to f k over n one. So what do these uh, variables uh, mean? So as you can see, you have y over n. What does y mean output? What does worker mean uh, n? So this little thing is your output per worker. And, uh, and then the other one is capital per worker and capital is equal to k, and then per worker, and so you have this right here. 
Uh, oh god, that is a horrible arrow. Let's fix that. So that is your k over n. Um, so there are a couple of assumptions, and I think we were doing assumptions in purple. Um, so first off, any increase in uh, capital per worker uh, gives you a uh, movement along the production function. Uh, um, so this, again, this does not mean um, that it shifts. The only thing that can lead the production function to shift is an increase in technology. By the way, this is very similar to the production possibilities curve. Uh, just like uh, there's an increase in technology that shifted. Uh, so this is actually a shifter. And uh, finally, you have uh, two reasons for growth. So you have either uh, capital accumulation, so I'm, I'm going to get K accumulation. So by this, they mean an increase in savings rate. Rate. I don't know why I put the period there. That's not a uh, acronym. And then you also have technological progress. Uh, so how does this look actually in a graph? So it's super simple. Again, I said uh, chapter 10 is a joke. Um, so you have this. It's basically, uh, let's do, uh, let's separate this a little bit. So it's a bit clearer. Um, have your little graph here. Uh, and the thing literally just looks like this. So it's instead of the production possibility frontier, it looks like this. You have uh, that. This also exemplifies the um, decreasing marginal returns to input. Uh, so as you can see, um, this is seen as like, for example, here, you're increasing, 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 increasing. And here you start to uh, go down. So, and like, if you were to take like the derivative here, and I'm sorry, I'm putting in math terms, but it's uh, if it's a bit easier to understand. So say I were to put the derivative here, this is gonna be, let's say that's gonna give me that at this point, the slope is like three, but the closer I am to here, this is gonna be one. So here for every um, uh, worker, if you increase, it's going to give you three units of output. But here, for every worker you increase, it's only going to give you one unit of output because the marginal return to scale uh, is decreasing. So, yeah, by the way, this is not in the book, so don't quote me on this. Don't try to memorize that. Uh, it's just an easier way for me to understand it. So um, if you guys find it easier to understand it that way, if this will let me raise, um, go ahead. And if not, just ignore this. It is not part of the course, so don't stress out about why the fuck is Gato talking about uh, derivatives. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So um, here you have y over n, and here you have uh, k over n. So this is your output. This is your capital uh, per worker. So again, uh, this is just uh, the book looks right now into the decreasing marginal returns uh, to inputs. So that's what I just explained. Um, and also uh, you have your increase. So say, for example, these guys just like invent, I don't know, vibranium from Wakanda and they can suddenly produce eight times as more. You're going to see your curve actually shift up. So um, this is the only way the curve can shift up. This this little jump is because of an increase in technology. That is uh, the only uh, thing uh, that can shift your uh, output per worker to capital per worker production function. Uh, and here I had a little note in my own notes, which I'm going to write it down. I don't know if it's um, important, but any increase in y, aka output, will require, ah, this is a relation, will require uh, more capital 
more capital uh, due to to decrease uh, output for worker. This is a little relationship you can remember. This just exemplifies your uh, decreasing marginal returns uh, per worker. And that's it. That is chapter 10.